Okay, everybody set. Good afternoon. I hope everybody enjoyed their lunch. Welcome to Goodman's and the ACC's presentation jointly with Goodman's of what in-house counsel have uh, need to know about AI. And uh, it's a very topical discussion. Uh, increasingly, every day I get questions in my practice around the expansion and use of AI, both for internal systems for uh, lawyers within uh, in-house counsel's groups, as well as the interaction between our customers and their customers and the use of AI in an ever-increasing uh, world of autonomous vehicles and all kinds of other technologies that we see approaching and the use of artificial intelligence. So I'd like to welcome you to Goodman's and um, it, for those in person, uh, your CPD credits are at the desk where you registered and those online on the website there are instructions for obtaining your credits as well as I said this uh, session is being recorded as well as presented online it's being recorded as well right for future use and so for all of the disclosures that are necessary uh, that's the use and intended use of the <laughs> uh, <laughs> if there is any personal information I'm sure that Goodman's will have a lovely discussion with you about those issues <laughs> I'd like to also uh, um, take a brief moment to tell you about the ACC and the work that we've been doing the Association of Corporate Counsel I see a lot of our my fellow board members here as well the ACC is present in Canada with a number of chapters from the West Coast in our BC chapter the chapter here in Toronto is part of the Ontario chapter and we are a group of uh, in excess of 700 members and we welcome you to join us at any time and hopefully in the future in your membership with us some of the benefits of joining are a number of different of these seminars and credits that you do uh, do obtain in order to fulfill your obligations to the law society as well as a tremendous amount of uh, materials that are available on the ACC's websites but the most important and uh, for me my personal benefit that I get is the ability to coordinate and discuss matters with colleagues that have similarity of interests and issues that come up on a day-to-day -day basis um, there are 40,000 members globally the it the ability of the ACC to spread internationally and to affect my my daily job and my coordination with my colleagues around the world is excellent and we've just attended the annual meeting in Phoenix this year the next annual meetings in Philadelphia and I encourage anybody to attend and everybody and to avail yourself of what the ACC offers both within our community in Toronto and around the world um, I'd like now to introduce Peter Ruby, who's uh, not just uh, the host here, but he's also a lawyer that does a tremendous amount of education for myself and uh, manages a number of my files. I encourage you to, to discuss matters with Peter. We've been here before in this room and seen Peter's updates annually on or biannually on uh, current issues in intellectual property and technology law. Today's topics are a little different, and Peter is going to introduce you to the other panel members. Uh, thank you for your attendance, and I'll be here at the end to s with some closing remarks. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, and um, we appreciate your business. <laughs> Isn't that what we're supposed to say? Um, I was in um, Dublin last week on business that many of you'll know is a major international tech hub. And I was meeting with in-house and outside lawyers from all over the world. And I can tell you that the issue that came up in just about every conversation was about AI and different aspects of AI, uh, how to roll it out, how to, how to uh, acquire it, what to do about data issues, the problems it's going to cause, who's getting fired because of AI, uh, major social and ethical issues. It's sort of all on the table. And I can tell you that it was completely fascinating um, to delve into this uh, particular subject, both on a business and a legal basis. And uh, the presentations you're going to hear from the four people up here today, um, I will venture to say, because I've had a bit of a preview of what everybody's going to say, is going to be equally uh, fascinating. And I'd just like to take a minute to introduce each of the panelists, and, and then we'll get going. Um, just to my left, is Cameron Schuler, who's the Chief Commercialization Officer and Vice President in Industry Innovation for the Vector Institute. Now, 
my guess is, is if you're here to learn or talk about AI, uh, or you're joining us on the web, you know what the Vector Institute, it is the leading, I'd venture to say, Canadian um, research institute with respect to AI, uh, and uh, particularly with respect to machine and deep learning. And uh, Cameron's gonna take a minute and explain exactly uh, what that is when we get going. Uh, but Cameron also spent eight years at Alberta's uh, AI Institute, and before that was in business for, uh, in different sectors acting as a CEO, CFO, COO. So he's a, someone who has tremendous experience uh, that he can share with us, not just about the technology, but also about how it gets commercialized, uh, which is of course what everybody in this room in some ways is most interested in. Um, next to camera is Nagendra Krishnamurthy, and uh, he is the head of legal and corporate secretary for Tata Consultancy Services in Canada, um, TCS, which uh, you'll know is a large multinational um, information technology and consulting company. And uh, his expertise, I think it's fair to say, is um, negotiating large IT transactions. And it's also worth noting that his company has actually developed several business-to-business uh, -business AI products and services. So he knows this stuff uh, from the bottom up and is working with it all the time. And last not, but not least is my partner in the Goodman's uh, litigation group, uh, ben Hackett, who focuses on IP issues, and a large part of his practice is dealing with patent litigation and the recovery of damages and, and profits in that area. And like all of our panelists, um, Ben is a uh, AI enthusiast, but maybe if you, you know, you'll forgive me for a moment. It's also worth congratulating Ben because he just qualified recently <laughs> to run the ba Boston Marathon. So um, not a small uh, thing qualifying in Chicago. Um, we've taken a look at the registration list for today. Um, and uh, two things struck me. First of all, uh, when we spoke about a year ago with the ACC, and Dan will remember this about maybe we'll do something about AI, at the time the thought was, well, that would be a really niche topic. We'll get a few people, the really interested ones. It wouldn't have um, wide interest. but. Um, you know, some people would be getting into it. Well, now, something like 10 months later, um, about 200 of you have registered for this session, either in person or online. So um, clearly, what was niche 10 months ago is now mainstream. The second thing that struck uh, us from the list of who's here is primarily uh, you are from companies that are either using artificial intelligence products or services or looking at using them, as opposed to being the technology companies who are developing AI technologies for use by others. Now, I say primarily because we have people, obviously, from some of the technology companies here or companies that are rolling or developing their own AI systems, but primarily we're talking about um, users, and, but also companies that have tremendous data sets which are, as Cameron's gonna talk about, very important to the whole um, uh, makeup of artificial intelligence. Um, so, and we're gonna focus our discussion accordingly given uh, the makeup of, of the audience. But um, before we get going with Cameron as our first speaker, um, I do uh, you know, think it's appropriate to give you a test because you know, we fed you, so now it's time for a test. So if I can borrow that for a minute. So, um, so here's the first thing. So who, who said this one? So we're at a point now where we've uh, built AI tools to detect when terrorists are trying to spread content and 99% of the terrorist content that we take down our systems flag before any human sees them or flags them for us. So just for those of you in the room, just call out, who do you think said this? Sorry, you gotta, you gotta be a little louder. So Mark Zuckerberg, we've got a winner here. There you go. So here you go, this is your prize. You get lint chocolates, and if you don't, if you don't share with your uh, table mates, um, it'll be like Lord of the Flies. All right, so let's look at the next one. Success in creating AI would be the biggest event in human history. Unfortunately, it, almost, it might also be the last, unless we learn how to avoid the risks. Who do you think said that? Anybody? 
<laughs> Sorry, I heard this. So it's not Elon Musk, that it could have been. Andrew Yang, that would be a good guess too, but that's not quite this one. Anybody else? Stephen Hawking, there we go. There's, there you go. Bell, you get some chocolate. Again, if you don't share, I don't take any responsibility. <laughs> All right, and one last one. Early AI was mainly based on logic. You're trying to make computers that reason like people. The second rule is from biology. You're trying to make computers that can perceive and act and adapt like animals. Anybody know who this one is? I'll give you a hint. Toronto. Jeffrey Hinton, right here. But you've got to share with another table. So, and, okay, there you go. So somebody said, well, you can pass it back to whoever said it. Terrific. There we go. Off to the back. So um, Jeffrey Hinton is a perfect segue for Cameron to talk about the work at uh, the Vector Institute, since Jeffrey Hinton is one of the leading scientists, maybe the leading scientist uh, at the Institute. So Cameron. Thank you. So I'm going to get up and move around. The, so here we go. So I'll try to keep this fairly brief, um, because what's even better than concise is usually brief and then we can actually get on to the discussion. So <clears throat> I believe in starting with an agenda, so we'll talk about AI in Canada. We're gonna talk about what is AI. Hopefully I don't thoroughly confuse you or I failed on the one count. And I wanna talk about practical examples of AI. So AI in Canada. We routinely hear that Canada could lead the world in terms of AI, and the fact of the matter is we do. We don't necessarily lead the world in the application of AI. So it makes me laugh every time I see that, but almost in a damn it sort of way. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, in, in uh, started kind of late 2016, early 2017, Canada created a national AI strategy. And I was one of the authors, along with people like Jeff and Joshua Bengio. The field used to be so tiny we could go by first name globally because nobody cared about, the, cared about it because it was considered a dead end with no commercial value. And so there are three primary institutes in, in Canada, Amy in Edmonton, Vector here in Toronto, and Mila in Montreal, and we are partners. And so what that uh, national AI strategy was, it really was, how do we actually retain the talent that we have? Because, because there was nobody in it, ultimately, when, it, when all of a sudden there was commercial value, everyone was starting to leave. So if we, if we ended up losing all the academics that we had, we wouldn't have AI in Canada anymore. So these are two of the biggest names. So uh, Rich Sutton is on the left. So Rich is in Edmonton, Joshua Benjiu on the right. And then there's Jeff Hinton, whose picture you've already seen. And Jeff actually has an office in our office. Uh, we have seating for 160 people, and one of those is his. We have over 400. Um, <clears throat> so Jeff has had a ton of awards, more than, I mean, I needed pages to put them all on there. On the top, you'll see something called the Turing Award. So the way we explain it is this. If you don't know what the Nobel Prize is, it's like the Turing Award for, or like the Turing Award for Computing Scientists, but we give it to physicists. So it is, there is no Nobel Prize for uh, computing science, but it's the Turing Award. So <clears throat> the way we kind of value research is who cites your work, uh, because ultimately it means that it's important in the field. So globally, Jeff is the most cited computing scientist in the world and the most cited uh, AI professional in the world. So he is incredibly important in this field. So what led us to today? So I, we've gone through a couple of AI winters that's actually named after nuclear winters. And so I'll try not to move around too much so you don't have to move the camera here. But anyhow, so <clears throat> what had happened was it showed a ton of promise and then it would die off. So it actually 2009 is really made, we made the, when Jeff made the breakthrough. But 2012 was when it became readily apparent that there was commercial value in this. And what happened was computers are about 80% accurate in terms of interpreting images. And it was going up by fractions of a percent, like a thousandth of a percent a year. Then all of a sudden they went from 80% to 90% one year. Industry stood back and said, this is really cool. Good things are happening. And so <clears throat> at that time, the stuff that's being, being, the foundation of this, Jeff actually did back in the 80s. So it takes a long time for some of this to get to commercial. And the two things that drove it, one was the availability of data. The other was the availability of computing power. So in terms of U of T and why Toronto is important. So if you look at all these, comp these companies, so you have different pieces of Google, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft. These are all people that came through University of Toronto. And so Vector isn't just University of Toronto, it's 11 institutes and universities, predominantly Ontario, but includes Dalhousie and uh, UBC. So this is why uh, AI is important in, this, in uh, Toronto. 
So how did we get to where we are today? So it's known as the Fourth Industrial Revolution. That sounds great. So what happened was, initially when it comes to data, there was one stream and it was really tiny. As time went on, that stream actually got much larger, but it was still only one stream. Whereas today, there are many, many different streams of data and the volume is absolutely massive. <clears throat> so why learning? So rather than talking about artificial intelligence, and I hate that term, so we have a guy named uh, John McCarthy to thank for that, but in terms of why learning is important, so think of it as an intelligent system. So rather than if you, a good test would be, and there's something called the Turing test, but a good test would be if you created a robotic form, because it's easiest for people to think about that, if you went into everyone's house and you got it to make coffee with a coffee maker, because everyone's different, but they're quite similar, that would be some level that requires human level skill, but not necessarily a lot of intelligence. So again, it's that adaptability piece. But learning is important, because you know where you are today, but you don't, need, you don't know where you need to get to. Second part is it's incredibly complex. And the third part is it changes. So if you think about using Microsoft Word, when you press A, you're gonna get A. Unless you have fat fingers like me, you might get something different, but for the most part, that's what you get out of this. And so a learning system <clears throat> is uh, to deal with the complexity of having kind of the human aspects and the ambiguous aspects. So what is AI? I'll let you read this. I don't need to read it for you. So there is no AI pixie dust or magic fairy dust. But in reality, this is kind of how it's portrayed. So unfortunately, a lot of what we think about AI is informed by sci-fi. And if you have fears about it, happy to talk about that. But it's, it's you know, ultimately, artificial intelligence is much more boring than that. <laughs> this is the easiest way to look at it. So you have it, your agent, which is the computer. You have it causing an action in the world. And in that world, it then has to give the computer feedback. So you have this continual feedback loop. So it learns, to, it learns from experience and adapts to its environment. So this is a very easy thing to look at and kind of grasp what happens. So think of a very iterative process. This is a little bit more confusing, but artificial intelligence is a really broad field. And so, <clears throat> again, it categorizes a whole bunch of stuff, but on the very top, you're gonna see deep learning. And just to be clear, if you take a look at the reference on here, it's the evolution of banking. So it's a, it's a huge, huge field. And so deep learning is not AI, but they tend to be used synonymously. This one probably is also just as confusing. So what I'm going to do is actually show you something that's even more confusing. So <laughs> this is what a neural net would look like in a very simplistic sense. So I'll see if any of you are good at math. How many different pathways are through this? I don't expect you to get it right. You can actually just guess. So it's 5,760 unique pathways through here. So what you would do, and, if, and so what it, if they could be, you could view it like a decision tree. When it hits one, it goes to the next one, et cetera. But, but ultimately, what you would do is, let's say you wanted to, it to identify a picture. Is this a dog or a cat? And so you'd know what it is on the one side. You'd run it through the system. And on the other side, how accurate is it? So keeping in mind, if computers were 80% accurate, 81% is really good. So if you did that, you'd have, you wouldn't have all these connected at the same time. There would be different pathways. So if you get a better result, you strengthen those connections between each one of these nodes. And... If you get a worse result, you start weakening those and strengthening the other ones. So now let's talk about something that might have a million nodes on it, right? So this, these are very computationally expensive. Microsoft built a natural language processing model that it took, I don't know, $26 million worth of computing to train it. So it's still very, very intensive. But this is just a simple way of saying, these are kind of how neurons in the brain work. They're kind of on or off, and that's how these models tend to work. So just think about it very simply in terms of there's a pathway that goes through use a lot of math and a little bit of judgment to figure out when it needs to be stronger or weaker. And in the other end, what you end up with is a better result than what you started with. <clears throat> so this is an example um, related to the size of problems that we have to deal with are too big to engineer at this point in time. So you need systems to help you. So the, the one on the left, the gray is actually what, hap what the computer did. So if you go back to that little cycle that I had. So on the left, the computer thought or expected the gray line and what happened was the red line. But 10 minutes later of training on this particular system, you can see how closely they overlap. And what this is, this is an ad adaptive prosthetic. So there's a shoulder, an elbow, a wrist, and a claw on the end of it. And so ultimately, if you tried to engineer all those different things, it would take much longer, but with 10 minutes of training, that's how it ended up. So a really good example of what AI is, is the autonomous vehicle. And so if you think about ambiguous environments, so think about AI being 
the ability to make good decisions in ambiguous environments. Those of you that drive, and I assume most of you do, but maybe not, when you're driving along, you don't think about where do I put my steering wheel, right? We just do this. If I'm in a crowded zone with lots of cars or a school zone with lots of kids, I'm gonna put my car in a different spot than I will on a four lane highway. What you have to do in terms of autonomous vehicles is you actually have to figure out where to put the steering wheel to put the car in the right area at the right point in time. So it's an incredibly complex problem. So <clears throat> in autonomous vehicles, you have a bunch of sensors, you have a GPS, and the GPS will show you where you are in the world. You have maps because you need to distill this down. So the resolution of Google Maps for this sort of thing is less than one inch in terms of an XYZ coordinate. Then you have vision systems, you have things like LiDAR. So all these are different sensors that you have to fuse and they all work at different rates. Your camera might sample 30 times a second, something else may sample once a second because you don't end up like these guys. So ultimately the complexity is really hard. So you need systems that will help you organize that. So if we talk about everyday AI, Netflix has a recommender system. Sometimes I find it good, sometimes I don't, but they have about 90,000 data labels and that's how they figure out what you might like. So when you have enough characteristics of this, they can say, okay, based on what you previously watched, these are the labels related to that. Here's a bunch of other ones that look like that. Another one would be Siri, because we have made advances in the voice piece, although I continually get frustrated at things like that because they don't quite get it. And Amazon, so the recommender system. So is AI evil? It is not, but I'll give you an example of where it can look like that. So in, in the UK, if you order a particular type of chemical, it would suggest you buy another chemical and they're for bomb making supplies. So <laughs> the computer didn't do that, people did and the computer picked that up, All right? So again, nothing nefarious with the system. It just was one of those, oops, we need to have a bit more oversight. Now this is a really cool example. So Udacity, the founder of this is a guy named Sebastian Thrun and Udacity is, on, is an online learning system. And so they looked at this, so uh, Sebastian was at Carnegie Mellon and then Stanford, he ran Google X, long history in AI. And <clears throat> what they did is they recognized that their salespeople, that their best salespeople sold twice as much as their not best salespeople for lack of not using a disparaging term. So rather than having the Jimmy Patterson model of firing your bottom people every month, they said, why don't we actually take the data that we collect, because this is what we do, and figure out what to do with this. So they actually took a look at how they operated and they took their lower performing salespeople and brought them up to a much higher level. To me, that's the excitement in this domain. <clears throat> Here's something we would have used for a long time. So there aren't too many people in this room that uh, don't remember a time when you couldn't use email because the spam was so horrible. So spam filter is AI, right? And we all help train it. If you put something into spam, then it learns from that and it helps identify what are the characteristics of these. Here's another system. When you think about intelligent system, if you went to an airport, you get on the plane, they go, pilot goes, you know what? Computers aren't working today, but we're going anyhow. It sounds like a 1960s rock star that's about to die, right? So we're not particularly comfortable without this intelligent system. Another example of this would be with autopilot. So what they found is with autopilot, if it does too much, when there's a catastrophic event, the pilots aren't prepared for it because they're not mentally engaged. <coughs> If they don't do enough, then they fatigue the pilot. So there's a balance in between. So I, I truly believe at this point in time, the opportunity for AI is human augmentation. So what do we do today and how do we do more, right? So how do we become more efficient? So finally, what happens if you confuse a computer system? So this is a bridge over in Europe and I did notice earlier today, I didn't reference these pictures. So other than that, all my references are good, but <laughs> so here's where somebody drew a Bugs Bunny Roadrunner tunnel. If you don't know what that is, uh, I expect most of you do. And here's the idiot that drove right into it. <laughs> so ultimately, we don't have to worry about confusing computers, right? We really do need to worry about confusing people because an autonomous vehicle wouldn't do that. So we have roughly 33 or 3,500 traffic deaths a day globally. Autonomous vehicles will bring that down. Even the assisted part will bring that down quite a bit. But one person gets killed by an autonomous vehicle and the whole thing is evil, right? So it's really a balance in between there. Anyhow, that is actually the end of my presentation. So <clears throat> again, when you think about AI, think about intelligent systems, things that, you know, for me, a good ex another good example would be, how do you cook eggs? So somebody shout out, what do you do to cook an egg? What's, your, what's the thing you do to cook an egg? Lawyers really aren't this quiet, I'm married to one. <laughs> Crack, it. Crack it, what else would you do? Sorry, was that? Boil water. Yeah, you could boil water. What else would you do? Put on the frying pan. Yep. 
So all these different processes, when you think about this, it's so every kitchen is laid out differently. How hot should the pan be? How many eggs do you want? How far is the fridge is on the left or right? So all these different pieces to it that can be different in each different environment. So think about a system that could potentially adapt to that. So it's not really, a, I don't, everyone has different opinions on this. I don't believe in sentient computers. Um, I'm not worried about AI, you know, my toaster jumping into my bathtub and killing me. Um, but I do think about, you know, how do we make the world a better place? And if, you know, McKinsey said that a third of all jobs that we have today didn't exist 30 years ago. And all of us that have been working for more than 10 years, we do our jobs differently. So anyhow, that's probably sufficient for me. So thank you very much for your attention. Great. Cameron, can I ask you to go back to your neural network slide, you know, the multicolored one with 5,000 connections? I'm not going to ask you to name each one. Yeah. Um, can you just explain to us a little bit more how a neural network gets trained? Like how that weakening and strengthening works? It really is a whole bunch of bit of iteration. So it's actually, you would consider it to be called weak AI. And what I mean by that is it needs lots and lots and lots of iterations in order to be effective. And so you would, you would not have them all connected at the same time. You'd start out with some sort of um, pathway through there that maybe you have half of them are full connections and half of them are zero connections or somewhere, it'd probably be somewhere in between. And then you just actually just start tuning it from there. So it really is a whole bunch of iterations. I mean, it can be millions and millions of iterations. One of the guys I used to work with solved heads up limit poker. And we didn't gamble just to be clear, but we played 4 million hands a second for four and a half months. And there aren't enough people, or a million hands a second for four and a half months. So there aren't enough people in the world to do that. So you need that level of iteration in order to be able to learn. So it just, when you think about this, you keep, you just keep trying stuff. It's a little more elegant than that, but just think about <laughs> trying it. And again, it's now 82% figuring out whether it's a dog or a cat, and it's 83, and then it goes back to 82. So you know you did something wrong, you got to back it up. So there's a lot of that in there. So, so let's take an example just to help everybody understand. So let's talk about... I was about to say facial recognition, but let's start with something better, yep. pet recognition. So yep. recognizing cats and dogs. Yes. So you've got, a, I guess it's an algorithm or a system. And then when you train it, I gather you need pictures of cats and dogs. Yes, you need the pre-labeled data. And that's the important piece, right? And it's not 20 pictures. 20 million pictures is a pretty good number. And uh, or millions or somewhere there about. So you'd actually have a predefined... So the way these would work is you'd have a labeled database, you train your model on that labeled database. So then when you put new images through, that's actually where you'd, you'd take a look at that measure in the future. And so again, when you think about how many iterations you start talking about, it's a pretty complex process. Okay, so um, if we look at those two um, component parts of a neural network, yep. you've got the science, which I gather is mostly math, effectively, or implemented yep. math. And you've got data. The people at the Vector Institute, like, yes. how did they do this? They sit in a room with these diagrams, or <laughs> like, what, what, what do they do all day? Yeah, so <laughs> really good question. Or where does the data come from? Maybe, like, what, you know, how does that divide up at the Institute? Yeah, so a lot of what we would do, being that it's advancing the theory of, of AI, uh, you have specific, so there's lots of competition around data sets. So it's something called AlexNet was the, uh, ImageNet was the name of the network <laughs> these pictures were trained on. And so people would work on ImageNet, for example, and the whole machine learning community, not just Vector, would work on that and see who could do better things and more advanced things. So they're, they're kind of these standards that are data sets. If it's healthcare, uh, our, a lot of our faculty are appointed at different healthcare institutions, but they gen they're generally tend to be standardized databases you'd work with as a, as a um, reference point. And then since part of your job is commercialization, so when you move to that stage, I gather you move beyond the standard data sets. Yeah, so we... You know, if it's for a bank, you want to work on the bank's data set, for example. Yeah, so Vector, we, we work a little bit differently. So when I was at Amy, we did create startups out of there, and we incubated them and grew them. At Vector, the commercialization piece is a couple different areas. So one is we believe in the adage of teaching people to fish versus giving them fish. So it really is about growing their own talent, you know, so they can go back and utilize that. And then the second part is uh, we run series on commercialization for people that want to commercialize in our, in our group. But yeah, it really becomes, can you solve a practical problem? So it's not as much about the science as it's about the business problem. Perfect. Thank you. Peter. Sorry, go ahead. Part of the, sorry, is a 
large part of the challenge then getting uh, quality data sets because probably most of us think of our data as awesome. But when you turn around to do something with it that's constructive, we, w my feeling is we have enormous limitations and we're still developing data sets without this type of forward thinking. Yeah, there's no such thing as really good data. There can be, but usually that's more of a theoretical thing. So data is always messy, so you need to adapt to it. But yeah, data is a huge problem because the, the volume you need, when you think about labeling data, so is this a glass or a cup, right? And so labeling data is interpreting data. It's actually not something that's clear. So there's, there's a ton of issues around the data side. Okay. Sorry, Matt. Go ahead. So do you give guidance to organizations then to assist them in developing data? Because it seems like a bigger front-end problem than something exotic like an AI tool on the back end. Yeah, so the answer is in the courses that we're creating, one of them will be data cleaning and prep uh, because those are pieces that you absolutely have to. If you don't get those right, you actually can't do the rest of it. Terrific. There's, uh, there's some questions here. And the problem isn't necessarily the data sets, but I guess concerns around the governance around the data sets. Uh, and I really see that lack of clarity around governance of data sets, which is limiting the full, uh, you know, the, the extent to which AI could be, these networks could be adapted and adopted uh, because there's so much concern and some vendors are presenting, you know, just because you de-identify data, then it's no longer protected under law and then we can use it for whatever we want. And so these concerns, I think, are what's driving a lot of the hesitation we're seeing. Yeah, so governance is one of our questions. It's so actually the next topic we're going to talk about. Yeah, so that you're 100% correct on that. The um, protection of data and the security on it is, is going to be very critical in this, I can see. Um, without really understanding that much of what you're, you're talking about. But having said that, um, what happens when malware uses artificial intelligence and learns that fast in order to hack a very important uh, system? So there, there should be concerns around that. It's not there yet. So the interesting thing about the security, the InfoSec side is currently the best hacks are still human hacks. So spoof, like if it's a big, if it's a big enough prize, they'll create a hack that's very specific to that one individual. But when you look at when Target got hacked, it was actually their HVAC provider that left the username and password on their desk and somebody stole that. Um, but yeah, there are concerns around that. Uh, I think when you look at information security broadly, it will be a perpetual arms race. And so that's, that's an area that is interesting for a lot of reasons. And it just deploying AI in that domain, there's too much variability around it for it to be use, useful now, but it's something that is coming. And, so. and we are gonna talk about two concepts that try and help deal with exactly that problem. Bell? One question I had was I was reading an article on the next reiteration of DeepMind where they don't even need human data sets anymore, where they actually learn by themselves without any human input. So I'm wondering at what stage where maybe data sets, the next evolution of AI don't even need human or any input in data sets possibly or? Yeah, so there, it, it doesn't necessarily need the human intervention. So it, so I know DeepMind fairly well because the first office they opened outside of UK was in Edmonton and that was my group. Um, so reinforcement learning uses data to inform what the, what the structure and model should look like. But somewhere along the way, you still need to be able to identify those labels and characteristics of it. Uh, and when you think about, so AlphaGo was a pretty big breakthrough. The largest game ever uh, that you could ever completely model out was checkers, and it's five times 10 to the 20th. AlphaGo is 10 to the 170th. So you can't even model out a 19 by 19 board. And so it, it's, there just isn't enough computing power. So those are some of the other challenges there. So at some point in time, um, you know, computers will get better at that, but it, it probably is based on a body of work. Um, there's nothing in production that I've seen that isn't labeled data, and you don't have models out there that perpetually learn and get deployed. You would actually freeze it at that moment in time and use it like that, and so it'd be, you, the characteristics of that would be very predictable. Um, because there certainly are examples of 
again, going back to my example of Amazon or when Microsoft Research put out their chatbot on Twitter and it turned pretty awful pretty quickly. <laughs> so again, those are the things that ultimately it's about good design uh, where, it, where it gets to. But at some point in time, you still need to be able to identify what that data is. So I don't think it'll surprise anybody that the first set of questions from <laughs> the people in this room turn on data. Because it's something, obviously, as lawyers, it's uh, we focus on, and it, it's actually our, our next topic to move along. And by the way, feel free, as you have been, to ask questions as we go, in the middle, at the end, whatever you want. We're all perfectly comfortable dealing with this as we go. So um, uh, as Cameron said, you need data to train these systems, whichever kind, whatever flavor of machine learning or deep learning, you, you need some data. And in some ways, the data or the, the outputs or the system that you get is only as good as the data that went in, how structured the data is, the quality of the data, et cetera. Um, that, of course, makes um, data sets that many of your companies have potentially quite valuable. And the value um, will depend, obviously, on exactly what you have, how much of it, how it's structured, is it labeled as a cup or a glass, et cetera. Uh, and all of those things are important. But the, the point is, is that um, the evolution and revolution of, of artificial intelligence technologies depends in part on the data, some of which it's your clients or your companies that hold it, and what applications they do with it. Now, um, the one thing we decided not to do today with respect to data is to teach you what you already know, like start talking about Papeda and, you know, uh, tort and the we we've all been to like a million of those sessions right where you talk about the law of contracts and all that you, everybody here knows all those different legal areas um uh the, the one thing i, I was going to say on a, a strictly legal point is that um people often don't think about the fact that there's is no intellectual property in data itself so in some parts of the world not canada but there are sometimes intellectual property rights in databases but um, you know, whether Cameron prefers to call it a glass or a cup, that data point, like it, there's no property in it. So when we talk about people owning it, that's actually a, a, a shorthand for something much more complicated um, than just IP. But we all know how to handle your own data. Like from a legal point of view, people have been doing this for a long time. Non-disclosure agreements, confidentiality, all that good stuff. Um, a little more difficult question, which comes up a lot in the AI space, is how do we share data in a way that's legal, uh, efficient, and uh, ethical or socially responsible? And useful, too. And, and useful, efficient, useful, right? How, how do we share it? Because, of course, if we think these AI systems are a good idea and they need data to work or to work better, then more data in some ways the better and the more sharing the better though obviously those have downsides and i propose that that's the question we focus on today for the purpose of um, the data part of this discussion talking about models for sharing data and i think for this group the legal implications of each one um, will pop out at you um, but before we sort of go to a few models um, or approaches I thought we'd deal with some high-level points, which is when we think about sharing data, uh, I'd suggest we can categorize the, the, the things to think about, the practical things to think about, into three categories. One is access. Who is going to have access to the data? The, the second is, well, if you have access, under what, um, under what conditions are we going to have it? Um, you know, for example, are we going to charge for it? Are there going to be restrictions on how you can use it? That is, the conditions under which you can jump into the pool of data. And then the third is who benefits, right? If the data is about individuals, um, but it's collected by a third party, who, you know, do you have to compensate the individuals for the value that's being attracted, extracted for their data? Who does it belong to? How do you share those benefits if it's multiple parties that are creating the value out of the data set? And um, what I'd like to do is um, focus on three cutting edge in the sense that they're now being implemented on a full scale basis, three different practical approaches that are modern to sharing data. And um, they do come up a little bit. Um, you, you see them often in the, the sort of management consulting literature, but you don't see it a lot in law. So I thought it's worth talking about them because candidly, 
Um, these are the things that when you're sitting with your clients and they say, I've got this data set, or I want access to a data set, these are different ways of thinking about how to manage the data, which add more value than just saying, you know, those awful letters, Pepeta, right, or Pippa that we're all trying, or even worse, the worst four language now, or four letters in the English language, GDPR, yep. right? Let's not talk about that. Um, so the first of these approaches that I thought we'd talk about is data trusts. Now, um, the good news for lawyers is there's actually no definition of what a data trust is, a generally uh, accepted one. But I'd like to propose to you four different ways of looking at data trusts, and you will, for your own organizations, um, recognize which one might fit what you're looking for or doing. Because the, you know, the lesson I think everyone will take from this is that there's no one size fits all. So the first one I want to talk about is data trusts in the one that's most familiar to lawyers, which is a framework of terms and mechanisms which you implement through a contract. That is, you figure out all the rules that will apply to the data, and you write them down in a contract. And everybody's got to sign a contract one-on-one, -on -one, um, and everything is predefined. Okay, So that's sort of the traditional framework approach. Um, uh, a second um, approach is um, what other industries call a mutual organization, which is the people that have the data get together and they contribute or group their data together and hold their own data as a group together and exercise uh, what the literature calls democratic control over it, which means essentially everybody who's pooled their data gets a vote on how the data pool gets used. In reality, the way this is implemented is um, the people who contribute or the organizations that contribute essentially elect a representative who then runs the data pool for them. Um, and uh, that results in the benefits being shared in accordance with the data you contributed to the pool. So it's a mutual organization. A third model, uh, for again, for all four um, data trusts, is um, a legal trust. Now, I don't know how many people, I won't ask you to raise your hands, took trusts in uh, law school, but my guess is the people in this room have not spent a lot of time since they graduated thinking about the law of trusts. Um, but you'll remember that a trust, a legal trust, has a trustee. It has beneficiaries. The trustee has fiduciary duties. The trustee has to distribute the proceeds, or the benefits of the trust, equitably, which doesn't necessarily mean equally. And it's, there's a huge legal regime around a trust. So if you adopt a data trust in the sense of a true legal trust, there's several hundred years of common law baggage that comes with it. And uh, just as a side note, I'd remind everybody knows of Sidewalk Labs has been looking at coming to Toronto. One of their early proposals is that the data that would come out of that property was going to be put in a data trust they stopped using the term data trust very quickly publicly, in part because people started to ask, well, who's gonna be the trustee and who's gonna have the fiduciary duties? And, and that's not, wasn't a useful concept in that um, particular milieu to talk about. So they're more on the collective basis now. Different terminology leads you to different legal results. Um, the other thing, of course, with a trust, one of the advantages is um, trusts are legal entities. You can move trusts to places like low tax jurisdictions. So if you have valuable assets, maybe that's a positive thing. You can also move it to jurisdictions that have lower privacy protections. Now, you know, with GDPR, that's questionable. But the idea with a trust is a trust can have a location other than where the original uh, business uh, was located. And then the fourth data trust form I wanted to talk about is a simple data store, which is really... Um, an, a, uh, a database, a technological um, place to store the data where the rules aren't in contracts, they're embedded in the storage themselves. So who can authorize, who's authorized to dig into it is a matter of who's got access credentials, who, who's authorized. And in the normal case, usually when we're talking about those data stores, we're talking about anonymized data. Okay, so that's data trust as a concept. Next time your clients are trying to figure out 
you know, how you're going to use AI in the context of your own data, here are some models you can look at. Um, the next point I thought it was worth bringing up goes to a question um, that was asked a little bit earlier, is, well, what about privacy, right? Because the AI, generally speaking, the algorithms, they don't care, right? If the information's about people, they don't, they don't care if it's sensitive, they, none of this, right? They, it's, a, it's statistics, it's math. So um, there's a concept called differential privacy, which is a math concept, which can be embedded into certain algorithms, uh, uh, deep learning or machine learning algorithms. And really what it's about is dealing with the data privacy problem which is we want to be able to analyze data about individuals. That's important for you know the Netflix example Cameron took us to. Um, we want to be able to do it, but we don't want to be able, when doing the analysis, to link back any particular data to a to a, a person. Um, so uh, you know, for example, we can do a study on the drinking habits, alcohol habits of everybody associated, you know, who's watching online or um, or here in the room. Um, and that would be fine with people. Um, you know, just Dan wouldn't want anybody to know that he's drinking 12 bottles of whiskey every day, right? Like you don't want to have it all um, be reassociated with people. And the, usually we do this by anonymizing data, but there's all kinds of research that's shown in the United States that if you have somebody's gender, date of birth, and zip code, um, you can figure out who they are for most Americans. So it's a bit of a fallacy that if you just group people, anonymize data, that you can't um, reverse engineer it. And there are techniques called linkage attacks or reconstruction attacks to try and where uh, wrongdoers try and do exactly that, figure out who are the individuals inside the data. So with AI, what we want so that people will give us their sensitive data, we want a guarantee of privacy that's embedded in the algorithm. And that's what... Um, differentiate, differential privacy is all about. Um, it's mathematical. I thought of putting the formula actually on the screen, um, but unless I made the font really small, the whole formula wouldn't fit on one screen. So, um, but it really is the idea that you can mathematically um, do the analysis in a way that uh, an individual cannot be identified. So it actually, when you described earlier, um, some of the principles of, of data are who's using it, what's the purpose. It's actually encompassed in that formula. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the other two points that's worth mentioning is it actually works better the larger the data set. And it um, seems to be, as I understand it, works quite well with the, even the most advanced forms of deep learning. You can Im embed the two uh, together. The last data concept I wanted to talk about is um, federated learning, which is something that um, uh, was it invented, or at least sort of the beginnings of it came up with only a couple of years ago and is now being implemented by Google in 2019. And that's the idea that instead of having a server somewhere that pulls in all the data, does the analysis in its own environment, and goes through the modeling that Cameron talked about to improve all those colored dots and the pathways and choose which one. Instead, you make a mini version of the algorithm and you send it into the remote devices. So think your cell phones. And the model, uh, the, that modeling, that analysis is actually done on the remote device, on the local data, and then the model, the updated model based on the learned model based on the local data is then uploaded to the cloud and integrated in a federated manner into the main global algorithm. Now, that sounds easy, but again, you know, um, from a technological, scientific point of view, it's actually quite difficult to do. But the idea is, is there's an opportunity, and people in this room will recognize, there's an advantage from a security perspective to not pull people's personal data or other data, it could be just business data, up into a single location to leave it where it is and uh, do the analysis that way. And again, works particularly well for mobile devices, like your phone in the middle of the night, um, works with uh, modern deep learning, uh, and is particularly good uh, for privacy because there's less chance of a breach. Um, now, with all three of these legal structures or, or legal approaches, I, I'm not gonna go through it now, but everyone here will recognize that these all require complex agreements in the case of, for example, using mobile phones, we're talking about um, 
uh, you know, terms and conditions, all that kind of thing. For differential learning, you're talking about having to prove it to regulators that you actually are recognizing people's privacy. There's no, there's no standard terms yet. It's all bespoke. It's the people in this room that are going to come up with the legal structure, the words that are going to govern, uh, govern all of this. But these are all uh, good tools to offer um, your clients. And then on the subject of dealing with contracts, I'm going to ask uh, Nagendra to jump in and, and talk about that. Sure, Peter. Thank you. I think before I get into the contracting issues on the data, I just want to share one point on the differential privacy you talked about, right? I think as a transactional lawyer, so for example, we don't need to get into the details of those mathematics or other stuff. I think the simple thing we should ask our businesses is whether the service provider requires data to provide the services, whether in the AI or any other kind of service. If it is not required, then there are tools in the market which you can use for uh, data anonymization or data masking. And I think as lawyers, that's what we usually recommend to our internal clients as well, or uh, to mitigate the risk from the data perspective. So TCS, I think uh, just uh, uh, Peter has already introduced TCS, but uh, just want to talk about Digitate. This is a division of TCS which specializes in AI and it has got some uh, award-winning uh, AI products. That's part of TCS. And uh, of course, these views are my personal, not that of company. It's only residual knowledge in your IP. <laughs> so when we talk about this uh, legal issues, I think uh, again, we have to segregate this as to whether you are building your own AI system or uh, you are using something that's available in the market. If you are building your own AI systems, I think most of the principles that apply in a professional services contract is what uh, we will be talking about. But I think the legal issues or contracting issues that we are going to deliberate is uh, more from a procuring a available AI product uh, from the market perspective. So there again, I think you have two models, the license agreements or the SaaS. Both have its own advantages and disadvantages. SaaS agreement gives a lot of flexibility from the commercial perspective because it's more on subscription model. License gives you probably more control in terms of how you handle the AI systems. And one of the issues I think we come across is on the derivative works because these machines create stuff on their own as well. And I think, again, just taking a step back when we talk about AI, I think uh, the, uh, Cameron has already defined that AI is something where the machines uh, adopt to the needs of the business, right? I think they change. In our context, what I mean by AI is where the machine learns, resolves, and has mechanisms to prevent from uh, future occurrence of, say, incident. Like there are AI tools that are available for incident management in uh, IT systems. So that's the context in which we are talking about these legal issues, not the sci-fi movies or fiction kind of AI, just to be clear. So there the derivative works concept is always debated and that needs to be addressed in the contract. Because I think uh, that's another copyright issue as well, which uh, Ben will be talking uh, probably in the due course. Even if the machines create something on their own, who owns the copyright? There, if you apply the traditional license philosophy, obviously, I think as a service provider, you would argue that uh, it should belong to the service provider because the base product belongs to the service provider. But that's something which needs to be addressed in the contract very clearly. And another uh, aspect is, I think, uh, copyright, I think, as we all know, belongs to the author. So it's important, like, we have proper employment contracts. Just I thought I will mention that as well. And the open source uh, software is unavoidable. There were times when like we used to represent in outsourcing contracts that uh, we will not use the open source without taking permission from the customer. But I think more and more technologies as they grow, OSS is uh, totally unavoidable. So from that context as to how you want to address from the contract, what reps and warranties you want from the service provider, or what disclaimers that service provider uh, 
wants to have is something which we need to address in the contract because it's i think uh, as a service provider uh, representative here on the panel i think what we face the challenge is that i mean we can't give the same reps or warranties or undertake same kind of obligations with respect to the oss so that's why it's always provided as is but having said that i think it is fair to ask the service provider to back up the functionality that is being uh, or sold in a particular transaction and the next and uh, most uh, contentious issue is obviously around uh, the liability right i think this uh, the first bullet that you see there i just took it from a title of a mit tech uh, uh, review blog i think that uh, very well explains how the liability will be decided in most of the cases including the ai it's somewhat similar to the concept of copyright as well right i think they do need humans to impose some kind of a liability so in that context again i think uh, what is the functionality of the ai right is it just like a tool that some operator is using or does it have some consequences on its own on the latter aspect i think we will uh, come back a little bit later but if it is a tool or a operator uh, is using that as a machine to provide the services in which case obviously the liability issues have to be addressed in the contract as we do for any other kind of liability issues right i think there again the concept is that it is traceable you are able to like uh, trace that particular uh, uh, liability to either the programmer or to some documentation that has been provided by the service provider if there are any deficiencies in uh, that as opposed to some machine generated consequences if it is a machine generated consequence then obviously i think uh, it takes a different shape and it's more complex because it's not so easy to trace so in those cases i think there are some uh, very interesting ideas that are being floated for quite some time now it's not like something very new one concept is a compulsory insurance scheme like i think in uh, motor vehicle uh, insurance in some jurisdictions it is there like the government fixes what is should, what should be the victim compensation that's mainly i think uh, being proposed in some of the complex ai uh, innovation to give that uh, comfort to the r&d departments also not to factor in the kind of class action scenarios and not to stifle uh, innovation and the other one is called as turing uh, registries where uh, they recommend a testing or certification process before a machine is brought to the market and more the autonomy to the machine more the premium or more the fees towards uh, the certification so that way they can equally distribute uh, or gives an opportunity for service providers or the inventors also to limit their liability so that's what i wanted to talk about the liability aspects of uh, Uh, this one i think there are a couple of other ip issues we will uh, talk about that and then terrific come back uh, perfect so uh what i'm going to try and do today uh in the time that i have is talk a little bit about how intellectual property uh interfaces with ai uh and if you look at the first slide you'll get a foreshadowing of kind of the the issue that i think that traditional ip faces when trying to interface with ai and um i'm not going to take the time to you know give you base definitions of what copyright is and patents trade secrets and trademarks uh they're the traditional categories that we think about when we think about intellectual property uh and i think this will be the last time i talk about trademarks because as i see it most of the issues uh with trademarks and using ai are the same as trademarks and not using I ai uh so the kind of more unique interesting issues that you need to think about as you go forward in using this technology are are more with a focus to copyright patents and then if not uh how you deal with them through trade secrets and so uh to audibleize the picture really it's a bit of a square peg in a round hole or to somewhat age myself a square floppy disk and around CD-ROM drive. And and so why do I say that? 
and you, you can see I have two like futuristic pictures. Uh, the whole system of patent and copyright is premised on the idea that a human is the so-called inventor or the creator. So inventor for patents and, and creator for copyright. And to a degree, and it really depends upon the use of AI, there is a material risk that the creator is not necessarily the human, and the innovator is potentially not necessarily the human. And at base, there's an incompatibility there that has to be overcome. And uh, less practical, but kind of more interesting for nerds like me, there's a whole debate about how we deal with this. Do we, do we have to create sui generis, generis rights and amend the Copyright Act and Patent Act to address this issue? Or can we kind of make that floppy disk work in the CD-ROM drive uh, in a more meaningful way? But that's more of a slow-moving and long-term kind of policy discussion. Uh, you know, if you've got a problem you want to deal with tomorrow, that's not an answer. Uh, we're not going to go off and amend the Patent Act for you tomorrow. Uh, so it's to understand that these issues are out there, understand what the workarounds are, so that you can kind of best deal with the situation as, as it, it faces you. Another issue, I guess, to think about is uh, patents in particular, the claims have to be drafted in plain language. And then once a patent's been issued, absent you know, relatively limited exceptions with respect to errors and omissions, the terms of those claims are, are set. And if what you're dealing with is, is an innovation in which it's evolving or learning along the way, mine, you have to pay, uh, figure out ways to address the fact that what you think you've invented might not be actually what you've invented in some time down the road. Uh, and so that's another kind of incompatibility that, that may exist to be alive to when you're dealing with your particular issue. And then the last is one that uh, is perhaps not unfamiliar when dealing with IT in general is that there are difficulties out there in obtaining patents over software-based and math-based solutions to problems because there are prohibitions on patenting of specific subject matter, particularly uh, mathematical formulae and natural phenomena. And so that's something else, of course, to be alive to. Um, just in case there's any doubt, you have to be a human to be able to get a copyright in um, Canada and the United States. It's pretty clear from the Copyright Act in Canada. And the fun example in the United States is the case that made the popular press where uh, monkeys were taking selfies, being the tripod being set up by a na nature photographer, monkeys taking the selfies by pushing a button, and uh, PETA brought a case on behalf of the monkeys asserting copyright in the photos. Um, and suffice to say, the monkeys lost, and it was clear on the statute that uh, humans had to be the creators. Uh, it probably was more of a publicity stunt than anything else in the States. You wouldn't need to bring a case in Canada to come to the same um, outcome. And ergo, if monkeys can't get it, well, an algorithm can't get it, or a computer can't get it. You have to be able to trace something back to a human. So. Uh, before we get into talking about, well, how do you address that, the next point I just want to make is, is that the answer isn't to throw up your hands and say, well, then no one can get patents for this stuff. No one's getting copyright over this code, so I don't need to worry about this. And, and so that's the next slide, which is to say, worry about this, please. So uh, this is a slide from the 2019 uh, World Intellectual Property uh, Office organization, rather, report on AI. Um, hopefully, you can all see it. Yes. So the purple line are, is the uh, rate of filings and, and patents that relate to AI. The green line is publications. Uh, the report uh, provides that there have been, between 1960 and, 19, and 2018, about 340,000 patent families related to AI that have, have issued or have been filed and issued between that time frame. And you can see that in 2017 alone, 
we're looking at over 50,000 of those 340,000. So there's been an enormous growth in patent filings relating to IP in the last couple of years. Um, somewhat apparent from this graph, but very clear from the report, is that there's a pretty good trend that the patent filings trail about 10 years from the literature growth. So if you look at the green line, that's a pretty good indication of where uh, we think that the patent filings are going to be going into the future. So the reality is already there's a fair, uh, fair amount of growth in patenting AI-related technologies and, frankly, AI it, aspects of AI itself, and it's only going to grow further uh, in the future. And if you're at all interested about this, I'm not going to go into it in great length, but it's a really interesting read to think about which companies are kind of the top five it's the companies that you would think about, but not all of them. So a lot of IBM, Microsoft, Samsung. Also interesting is that um, China, especially in the academic context, academics then patenting, it, the rate of growth is um, astronomical in, in the amount of patent filings globally. So it's something you need to think about, both in respect to maintaining co competitiveness with other people operating in whatever space you're operating, and also, not to be forget, forgotten, do I have freedom to operate to do the things I want to do? Well, I should probably pay attention to whether someone else has already beat me to the punch there. So this is, I guess, winter isn't coming, winter has come. So the next uh, slide is just to make a relatively simple point from the same report that the areas to which people are obtaining patents relate to AI techniques, so that's approaches to machine learning themselves and other aspects of uh, AI, the various flow charts from that banking slide that you saw before. Also, functional applications, patents over natural language processing, speech processing, computer vision, and then also applications. So, you know, easy to understand. We see that car, you know, the LiDAR part piece of it, how it interfaces, other aspects of of um, in the applications, self-driving cars, uh, pharmaceutical drug discovery, those sorts of applications, that's a third kind of bubble in which uh, patent filings are, are, are being made and patents being issued. And you can see from the Venn diagrams, the overlap internal to those applications is also rather significant. So I don't have fun graphs and charts with respect to copyright because Copyright exists without having to file to obtain it, but therefore you, you, you have to accept that there's also a lot of copyright that's already subsists in the work that's already been done. So um, to kind of work through what are the issues that you ought to think about, okay, I've set up the problem, I've said these are things you need to worry about, so what, how do I think about, how do you have to think about IP issues a little bit differently when it comes to dealing with AI. So w one thing is, yes, you get copyright in code automatically. Uh, it's a composition, uh, it's artistic work. If your employee does it for you, the statutory default is you own it, but prudent counsel will want to make that clear in employment contracts anyway, so there can be no doubt. Um, and the one thing, though, to keep in mind is, um, you know, how are your inputs protected? And data mining is one piece, but just if we can hop to the last bullet first, which is, well, what do you get when you get copyright in something that you've created in this space? You're really talking about computer code in, to a large extent. Uh, difficult, although people might attempt to assert copyright in pleasing arrangements of information in a database, but the nuts and bolts of what we're talking about is code. And keep in mind the extent of that protection. So it's to that composition itself. It's not to the inventive solution to a problem. So if someone has your code, sees how it works, comes up with a different way to affect the same result, it's unlikely that you have a strong claim in copyright in respect to that. So what am I saying? The rights in, with respect to the outputs, they're relatively narrow. They're, they're not going to give you the protection that you're looking for if what you want to really be is a monopolist, right? It's a, diff it's a much narrower scope in most instances. So 
The other thing to think about, which is something on the other side of the coin, not what are the rights that I might be able to get in the endeavors that, that um, my company is engaged in, but what do I need to look out for? Uh, one thing to look out for is as I'm going about trying to train my system, as I'm going about trying to uh, provide inputs to my system, um, does copyright exist in that, in, in that which I'm using? And am I using it in a way that potentially infringes copyright? So I'll give you kind of the easy example, uh, and then there's a bit more of a thorny question as to whether the nature and extent of your data mining or text mining does engage copyright. So the easy example, which is also a popular press example, is there was an artist in Quebec who was engaging in, he created an art installation that used AI system to generate visual works of art. Um, and, but the way that the setup was is that only where the art had a 83% match or higher to an other artist's work would it then print out and then be displayed in, in, the, um, in the gallery. And it was, it was being done for kind of a political and philosophical reason but the outcome was that the artist that was the 83% check turned around and sued that artist. I wish they weren't both artists. It would be easier for the A and B. But he went and turned around and sued him in Quebec court for copyright infringement. Said, you're, you're trying to replicate my compositions through this indirect way. Um, there's no reported decision on that. But that, that's one way that what you're using might run a foul copyright, it's, it's probably one of the more extreme examples because the endeavor is almost built with a desire to replicate some other output. Um, more difficult, but something to think about is, you know, when I'm mining data to generate my database, assuming I'm not using what I already have that's now been ni nicely tagged, but I'm trying to el get otherwise acquire data to, to feed the, the training of the algorithm, you know, is this, is there original content in there that's not being anonymized or obscured that I might be accused of then uh, using or appropriating that, those, those rights? There are exceptions with respect to research purposes. When you get into research for a commercial endeavor, it gets a little bit fuzzier. And things to think about is also just, um, and this is probably not as much of a concern for this room, but am I overcoming technological protection measures? to then acquire that data, because that's going to add a color to what I'm doing and, and whether it's I'm doing this for some sort of noble research purpose or something of more commercial nature. So I think from a copyright perspective, it's really looking at your inputs, looking at what your outputs are, and keeping in mind that if you're trying to, trying to avail yourself of copyright for commercial protection, it's probably not going to give you the strongest uh, I don't know, the, the best arrow that might be in your quiver. So the other arrow, or one other arrow, is of course patents. And I'm not going to talk uh, generally about patents and, and that which you need. Uh, there is an issue that I, I foreshadowed that is an issue that exists already with respect to software-based um, solutions, which is patentable subject matter is always a difficulty. You can't um, you can't get patents over mere mathematical formulae. And uh, in the 80s, uh, some federal court judges essentially analogized um, most software to like simple computers in an abacus and said, well, any idiot can do that. It's just doing it really well. And so you can't get a patent over that. Um, just keep in mind a couple of things. The one is that that's not the end of the debate. That's just an invitation for an artful patent agent to figure out the aspects that are patentable. Uh, there's been a great uh, move in Canada after the um, Amazon case of the Court of Appeal, much more room for the patenting of business methods if you structure them correctly. And in the US in particular, um, there, was, uh, there have been difficulty in, in patenting um, abstract theorem and natural phenomena, 
because of a uh, Alice decision of the Supreme Court. But this year, their uh, USPTO has put out guidance as to how to engage in that analysis, most recently refined in October. And it's a real opening to further think about patenting uh, what might otherwise be thought of historically as not patentable subject matter. So that's, don't walk away from it because you think, oh, I'm getting close to math or computer software. Um, but that said, the real thing to think about is how do we get over the hurdle of the fact that I'm dealing with a square floppy disk in a round CD-ROM drive? And the way that you get over it in the short term is through patenting other aspects of what you might think is the most innovative part of your solution, which is this AI-based solution. So uh, I do a lot of pharma litigation, and so an analogy that kind of came to mind is if you think about you have an AI-based system that learns from past um, molecules and the activities they might have in the body or through assays, so structure-activity relationships, and what you're trying to do is you be able to train a system to then generate a new molecules or hypothetical molecules and predicted activities. So essentially take drug discovery and do it through an AI model. The thing that might be the hardest to patent is actually the algorithm that's doing that prediction because that is, that's the math. But how you arrange a data set so as to most efficiently or best set up that system that's something that you might be able to better get protection over. How to best and most efficiently train based on that data set, that's also uh, a, something that you should think about. Is that something that maybe we can be getting protection over? The best arrangement of the whole system to solve an unmet need, a problem, that's something too. And of course, the outputs, that's also something, okay, well, maybe that's something I can get patenting about that, patents over that. So, but why am I saying all this to you? Because you presumably don't have sitting bubbling away back at the office, a drug discovery lab doing this, is when you go to contract with providers that are offering aspects of that service, or you're dealing with your employees who are carrying out aspects of that service, you have to keep in mind that it's only inventors who can then assign rights to you in those inventions. So you have to think about, okay, because I'm dealing with a square peg in a round hole, and I'm going to have to work around the fundamental difficulty I have because of patentability of subject matter and that perhaps my, my, my processing is the innovator here. Who do I need to make sure I have the rights from so that I can then get the patent protection I ultimately need out of my drug discovery process? And so that's the most immediate thing to think about uh, is when contracting with people or setting up these systems, make sure that you have your rights protected with respect to all the potential inputs that you're gonna ultimately need to sell to the patent office as being your invention. Uh, another thing to think about with respect to patents in this area, although it's similar to patents and software in general, is how do you detect infringement, right? This isn't always something that you can look at what your competitor's doing and say, aha, they must be using the same algorithm that I'm using. It's, it's, it's kind of more under the hood. So an argument against being really excited about patents is an argument that says, well, you're never going to know if your competitors are actually infringing. Your competitors are never going to actually know if you're infringing. And when you're looking for budgeting perspectives and how much are we going to want to spend as much money as we need to on in this area, it's another factor to consider, although not foreign uh, to any other sort of software-based perspective. The last thing I'm going to say, and I'm gonna flip through uh, trade secrets and say them together because I need to leave time for Peter to talk about the last few slides, I can see that from his body language, is, <laughs> is that um, in this area in particular, you know, your options are if you have something of value and you wanna protect it, to either seek patent protection or try and keep it secret as in the form of a trade secret. And two things to think about if you're engaging in that sort of analysis internally. One is AI has been, and I think continues to be an area with a lot of academic interest where the smart people that you want to be helping you are people who generally speaking have a desire to publish. 
And if you want to get the best talent to in, in, inboard any of this, you're going to be finding uh, women and men who want to tell the pe world what they're doing because it's a value to them. That's incompatible with the trade secret. You can't find people, bait them to come and have them think they're going to publish and they say, oh, by the way, we can't tell anyone how we do this. That's really difficult. So one thing that to think about is, well, once you've patented something, once you've applied for the patent, you do have much more liberty to disclose what you're doing. The second thing to think about, and that hopefully will transition a little bit into what we're going to talk about next is, when we think about going forward as to how, how you need to act ethically with AI, how you need to have audit rights and transparency in what you're doing with AI, you might not, that might be incompatible with maintaining something as a trade secret in general. If we need to be able to go back and show people that what we were doing wasn't coming up with biased outcomes, for example, then it's very hard to do that while also saying, but no one can see what I'm doing. So that's another factor to think about if you're saying, well, patent, trade secret, how do I want to go about protecting my technology? Acting responsibly and potentially avoiding tort liability in the future might require you to not go down the trade secret route. So um, those are, I guess, a few thoughts about a very wide subject uh, interfacing with a very broad and amorphous concept of AI. So um, th thank you, Ben. The th last bit we thought we would do is really a series of quick hits because, of course, as in-house counsel, you do many things, but two of the things you do are governance and contracting. So we thought that what we would do is put up a couple of slides that you can use a little bit as checklists. So the first uh, is on governance. Uh, by the way, there's, there's tons of writing on AI governance. I've put up um, the covers of two papers. Uh, the Responsible AI one is one written by an organization I'm involved in, the International Technology Law Association. The one uh, on the other side, the CIO strategy is only about three weeks old. Both are terrific as guidance for how to do governance um, for AI projects. But we've put up what we thought collectively were some of the governance issues. The compliance regimes, we don't have to talk about much. Everybody knows about um, those. But um, we thought this is an opportunity also if people had you know, the, a comment they wanted to say, whether it's on the panel or from the audience, about any of these. Some of them we've talked about already, like data suitability, um, iteration, that sort of thing. Um, but Sorry, there was a question here. Go ahead. Hi. Um, my question is, is sort of a mix of the IP and ownership and data governance and contracts and how it all mushes together, to use a really technical term. Um, because what I'm seeing is, you know, there was the comment about focusing on the functionality and having the vendor stand behind the functionality. But it really, there's an intersection between uh, ownership and getting in under the hood to see how something works and knowing that it's either encrypted or protected and, and people can't get access to the data that you're providing. And what I'm seeing is most um, SaaS providers will be very um, limited unless you're spending gobs of money. They're not looking at the value of the data that's going in and there's very limited uh, liability if the protections that they control and are creating are breached and if there's some malware or there's some coming in and it seems to be a fairly standard within the industry that they'll give you maybe you know 12 months of whatever you paid them for access to their service yet you're giving over <laughs> very very valuable information that they aren't standing behind and is that something that you see the industry continuing to do and it's kind of in a way user beware and you better find some insurance to protect yourself or so that, I think, brings up right into the heart of the contracting issues. Nagendra, yep. do you want to start? No, I think you're absolutely right. I think when we look at some of these cloud agreements and uh, the SaaS kind of uh, transactions, the limits on liability is obviously very contentious, and uh, there are exceptions to that. And in case of SaaS, I think uh, the, the, there is no... I mean, it's the, the vendor is only providing a service, like I mean, the software license as such is not there, right? So from that perspective, your exposure also will be limited. With respect to the data, obviously, I think there are ways of handling that, depending on what kind of access uh, the vendor may have to the data. As I was telling earlier, I think in certain cases, there may not be any need to have access to the data itself. So it's best to have those sort of access controls or uh, 
data masking uh, tools in place. Where the service provider needs to absolutely have access to the data, there also you should look at what are the preventive measures to prevent the breach. Because by having on paper what we have seen like an unlimited kind of liability for the vendor may not also help. Some of these are like very niche providers as well. They may not even have that much financials to like, they may simply agree to unlimited liability on the paper, but whether they will be able to really support is a good thing which we need to also think through, right? One of the things lawyers are really good at are analogies, right? We, when we don't, when we have something new, we try and figure out what it looks like. And so I think a lot of what we're seeing is companies that make regular SaaS applications or on-premises systems, they're giving their customers agreements that look a lot like they always have with restrictions on liability. And I query whether one of the main differences with uh, AI systems are, are in some cases two, two differences. One is some of them have the potential to do tremendous damage, even more than some companies are used to, for example, in the automated decision-making context. Um, the second is it's a little bit of a black box. I mean, you look at what Cameron did, you know, how, how do you figure out whose fault it was? Like 40 people worked on it, 12 companies on the project. Some of the research came out of a university. The data came from you. Um, you know, litigators try and sort that out as best you can, but this is a classic um, insurance problem, right? But the problem is, is at the moment, insurers haven't put their hands around what their risks are, so they don't know what kind of premium to charge. So I, I don't think we're there yet, but it's a great question of how are we going to divide up the risks when you draft these these clauses. Other questions about maybe the contracting points. Please. Hi, th uh, thank you very much for that. I had two questions, and you can pick which one you think is the more interesting. Uh, one on differential <laughs> privacy. Uh, you talked about it being a guarantee. Uh, but my understanding is it's essentially a balance between output optimization, basically how good is your insight, versus privacy. And so there's necessarily a risk call in how it works. So, so I'm happy to answer that one quickly. Yeah. Like, you're 100% right that there are no guarantees in life at all. So when we talk about guarantees, it's guarantee in context. I mean, all businesses take risk. What you have the option with differential privacy is of driving down the risk component to qu relatively low levels as compared to other techniques. I would, I would also add to that because it's a limited use, right? So it gets provided to you for this specific purpose. Anything outside of that doesn't count. So then you're violating it. So it just, it really is that framework in which you grant the, the privilege of using it. And then the the other point I had working for what I think is traditionally a customer of software services is um, around derived data. So whether that's metadata or downstream use of anonymized aggregated data and how in a con uh, contracting context you deal with value there. Because more and more my business partners say to me, we've been giving away billions of dollars in value for years under this clause that you see in most MSAs, you know, I can use anonymized data for improving or developing my products. And sort of, have you seen any, are you seeing any changes in that, in that regard? So I'll let other, other people speak. <laughs> we, we at Goodman's have the benefit of sometimes we act for vendors and sometimes for customers and we're completely mercenary. So we'll take everybody's money. Um, but what it does give us is it puts us in the middle. So you get an opportunity to see both sides. And I think the reality is there's no market yet. There, there, um, there's bargaining power, and um, the issue I see actually starting to creep up a little bit more is um, I will let you train your system, facial recognition, uh, vision, whatever, on my world-class data, but now the deal is going to be you can't then resell your improved system to my competitors. So there are all of these additional dynamics that are coming into play. Um, but unfortunately, I, I don't have a good answer for you because um, at the moment, there doesn't seem to be any standard yeah. terms. Well, I think it's difficult. <laughs> yeah, there's certainly uh, one of the companies we deal with, part of their goal, you could kind of look at it like federated learning as well as you standardize the schema. So think of rows and columns. 
and you do that across businesses, you're perpetually able to learn more from your external models. But that's contracted as we are going to do this. Um, so, yeah, I would just say the one thing to think about there, wearing another hat that's not on my bio, is is that uh, for today at least, is that there's also potentially competition risks in there. You create a closed system, and only all the players who standardize their data get the benefits of that. And you start creating these little walled gardens, and then you also have to think about competition issues when you go that way. Yeah, competition's a great one, because when you think of computers, when they try and optimize a problem, yeah, that's what competition authorities call price fixing <laughs> or collusion, right? Find the best price. You tell the computer to do that for an industry, it can do it. Um, thank you all for coming. I know Dan had a few concluding remarks, but we really appreciate uh, the Peter, people in the room. If you don't mind, I think just uh, want yeah, of to point out that uh, the EU guidelines on uh, ethics in AI is also a very good reading material if you want to see like how the EU's, uh, they call it as a human-centric approach where they emphasize on this uh, human agency oversight, transparency and accountability. And if those things are actually built in the design, I think even the government of Canada has come up with this uh, impact assessment for algorithms. So those things, if they are built, I think this artificial intelligence in some cases maybe better than the human intelligence, the way it is designed, because it can take out that unconscious bias of the human intelligence as well in certain workflows. Terrific, that's a good point. Well, thanks everybody for coming. I wanna ask you uh, as a favor to myself and the ACC to fill out the forms if you can, and we really get good feedback out of that and understand how to direct uh, future programs. I want to, again, thank Goodman's for their continuing sponsorship of the ACC and Peter and the great panel and an incredibly interesting uh, discussion that we've had today. Thank you all for coming and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.